Good evening, everyone. My name is William Downs, president of Gardner-Webb University. Tonight, we are pleased to bring you the first in a series of town hall discussions that we call Web Connections. These are gonna be town hall discussions that address issues of critical importance to the Gardner-Webb community. Not surprisingly, the topic for our first session this evening addresses the ongoing global pandemic current health care issues here in Cleveland County, as well as the prospects for recovery this year and beyond. The essential question before us this evening is, where do we go from here? We have a small live audience of Gardner-Webb students with us in the room tonight, and we are recording this session so that we may share it online with the broader Gardner-Webb community. Most importantly, we have a panel of experts here with us this evening. Uh, the panel is going to lead our discussion and I'll take a moment to introduce each of our experts to you. First, we have Tiffany Hansen. Tiffany Hansen currently serves as the health director for the Cleveland County Public Health Center, which she joined in April of 2020. Prior to joining Cleveland County, Tiffany served as the health director for Dakota County, Nebraska for six years. She holds a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's degree in public administration from the University of South Dakota. Next is Deshay Oliver. Deshay Oliver currently serves as the Deputy Health Director for the Cleveland County Public Health Center, where she has served in numerous public health roles and positions for 13 years. She graduated from Gardner-Webb University with a BS in Health and Wellness in 2006, before completing her Master's in Public Health from Walden University in 2009. She began uh, leading the health department's COVID-19 response efforts while serving as interim health director in January of 2020, and has continued to serve in a leadership capacity in the agency's COVID-19 response uh, in her current position as deputy director. And third, our third panelist is Dr. Nicole Waters. She's a native of Cleveland County. She served as a member of the nursing faculty here at Gardner-Webb University since 2011. She began her, her nursing career in 1998 when she graduated with a diploma in practical nursing from Cleveland Community College. She earned an associate degree in applied sciences in 2001 from Gaston College, a bachelor of, of science in nursing in 2006, and doctor of nursing practice in 2014 from Gardner-Webb University. And if that wasn't enough, she went on for a Master of Science in Nursing from Western Carolina University. Dr. Waters has clinical experience in areas including gerontology, uh, medicine and surgical uh, areas, pediatrics, and orthopedics. She currently serves as the Associate Provost for the College of Health Sciences and Interim Associate Provost for the School of Psychology and Counseling. So welcome uh, to all of our guests and welcome to our panelists. Now, our format this evening is uh, we're going to plan to spend about half of our time with some questions that uh, I have prepared here for the panel, and then we're going to give our students in the audience a chance to, to engage the panel with some Q&A. So our first question, and I'll throw this one um, to Ms. Hansen. Could you please give us a, a sense of what our, our current situation is here uh, in Cleveland County? Numbers of COVID cases hospitalizations, recoveries, deaths, what, what is our current snapshot? And actually, Dr. Downs, I'm going to ask Deshay to share wow, this with already us. Wow, already <laughs> punting to Deshay, okay. I was just, uh, I actually prepared some numbers before coming, so I have those in front of me. So um, as of today, we have had a total of 9,187 COVID cases in Cleveland County. We have had a total of 420 cases in the last seven days which comes out to about an average of 60 cases a day. Uh, in the last 14 days, we have had a total of 977 cases, or about an average of 70 cases a day. We currently have 39 Cleveland County residents that are hospitalized from COVID-19. We have had a total of 184 deaths from COVID-19 in Cleveland County. And our current positivity rate is 12.8% compared to the state rate of 7.9%. Okay, so uh, that gives us a sense of, of where we are. Um, 
maybe I'll entice uh, Tiffany to, to go after this one. Are we better off now than we were, let's say, six months ago? Are things getting worse? So it kind of depends on how you look at the data. We did see very high spikes in our numbers following the holidays, both Thanksgiving and Christmas. We do, um, as Deshay mentioned, uh, have been recently seeing declines in our numbers, so we are seeing some improvement. Um, our numbers compared to six months ago probably look fairly similar, but based on those spikes we had after the holidays, we are seeing some improvements. So Deshay, you, you, um, you indicated that the positivity rate in Cleveland County significantly exceeds that of the rest of the state. What's, what's going on here in Cleveland such that, that we're having a much more difficult time? Well, just to kind of give a better explanation, first and foremost, of what that positivity rate is, essentially, it's the percent of people that are testing positive from all total tests done in Cleveland County. So of all tests that are conducted in Cleveland County, um, just under 13% of those people that are being tested are testing positive. Um, and I think that's just really an indication of the fact that uh, coronavirus in Cleveland County is still fairly widespread. Um, some people may argue that um, the positivity rate can be manipulated uh, because the more tests you do, um, likely the, the lower your positivity rate could potentially be because you're testing more individuals. Um, however, we are testing a lot of people in Cleveland County. We're averaging um, about 3,500 to 4,000 tests a week. Um, so I don't think that it's necessarily due to our testing rate. I just think that we're seeing still a pretty substantial impact here in Cleveland County. Dr. Waters, can you give us a, a snapshot of how we've fared here at Gardner-Webb and, and, and your sense of how we've dealt with the pandemic over the last 10 to 12 months? I am excited to say that we have been face-to-face -face on campus. So I think the students can agree that maintaining a learning environment face-to-face -face is very important for our campus. I have been very pleased with the the mask wearing, the social distancing, everything that we have in place with that. And to say that our numbers and to stay in a congregate setting like we have had, um, it, it's just, it's almost unbelievable actually. But um, I, I think everybody working together, everybody knows what we have to do to maintain face-to-face -face learning and that's what they want to do. But we have had very limited cases. We have had quarantine, but that's because we have a, a strict quarantine policy, which we should, so that we can maintain our learning environment. So I have been very pleased with the past 10 to 12 months. My sense is, well, I, I know we're extremely grateful to, to our friends and colleagues in the county, but, but my sense is that we're doing well because we've worked well with you and you've intervened to help us with contact tracing and those kinds of things. So our gratitude to you. Now, I know one of the, the pressing issues, the question uh, that so many of us have here in um, early 2021 is there's a vaccine. Uh, how safe is it? What's, what's your recommendation? Now, there are some people out there on the fence. Others are getting it. Some say they never will. What, what, what message do you have for us? Yeah, so I can speak to that first. Um, really, so both the vaccines that we have out right now that have received emergency authorization use, both Pfizer and Moderna, have both went through three phases of trials, which is very standard for any type of vaccine that we're going to administer across the country. In third uh, phases of trials, they actually recruit about 30,000 plus participants in those and evaluate side effects, the number of people who experience side effects and what those side effects may be, along with the percentage um, that experience those in those phases. And so with both Moderna and Pfizer, the side effects are common among them that are common among any other vaccine we would see. So redness, soreness, tenderness at the site of injection, headache, fatigue, fever. We see those across all other vaccines that we administer as well. Um, with both Pfizer and Moderna, we do see more significant people experiencing side effects after the second dose. So about 65% of people experience those fever, headache, soreness, tenderness after dose two, um, but they go away within 24 to 48 hours. So at the health department, of course, along with ACIP recommendations, we do strongly recommend people getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, if somebody's already had COVID, do they still get the vaccine? 
The current recommendation is yes. Okay. Uh, how are we doing on supply in Cleveland County? So Cleveland County to date has received just over 4,000 vaccines. Uh, 2,000 of those actually have been redistributed from Atrium. So we're, we are receiving limited quantities of the doses from um, NCDHHS. So we really do distribute every single vaccine we get. And we're really thankful for our partnership with Atrium to be able to give us um, even more to be able to get out to the county. And if we keep that current pace, what's your sense of how long it will take to get all the relevant populations vaccinated, at least with, with the, the, round, the first round? So currently our plan is to vaccinate 750 residents every day, three days a week uh, for first doses. Although we realize that we don't have adequate allocations at this time to be able to do that. Based on our current extremely limited allocations, we foresee it taking a substantial amount of time for us to complete that. We know currently with group two, which is 65 and older, there's around 19,000 residents in the county that qualify and we're receiving anywhere from 300 to about 700 vaccines a week from the state. And so it is going to take us quite a, a, lot, a little while here um, to get through the group two folks, um, as long as dose allocations remain the same. Now, Deshae, uh, for those who, who might not know, if, if, if I'm hearing this for the first time, where do I go to get my vaccine? If, I, if, I'm, if it's my time to get it, where do I go? Uh, so right now in Cleveland County, the only two uh, providers that are currently receiving vaccine is Atrium Health um, and the Cleveland County Health Department. Um, so I can speak to how we're currently administering the vaccine. And of course, we have to administer it um, in alignment with the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Service uh, vaccine prioritization framework. Um, so right now under that framework, we are in group two, uh, which is for individuals that are 65 and older. Um, we, we've tried a number of different ways really to uh, schedule appointments and get these people to the vaccine. Um, we're actually in the process now of rolling out um, a new way, um, hopefully to, to get people access to the vaccine that is a little bit more uh, consistent and understandable and equitable across the board. Um, it's been very, very difficult from week to week uh, with not knowing exactly how many vaccines we'll receive from week to week to plan in advance. Um, historically, we learn on Thursday evening uh, how many vaccines we will receive on Monday. Um, so, you know, essentially one work day prior to receiving the vaccine and then having to maneuver very, very quickly to come up with a plan as to how we're going to get those vaccines out to the community. Um, however, we learned earlier this week um, that we will begin to receive our dose allocations on a three week basis. So in other words, on Thursday, we will receive what our expected allocation is for the next three weeks, uh, which makes planning for that much, much easier. Um, so moving forward, what our intention is and what our plan is, is to actually open up our COVID vaccine scheduling line uh, every Friday evening from 1 to 5 p.m., where individuals can call in to schedule an appointment for a number of clinics that will be held the following week. Um, we'll actually be releasing information on that tomorrow um, to highly publicize throughout the community. So anybody, regardless of internet access or where they live in the county, as long as they have a phone, um, they can call that phone number on Friday afternoons to um, try to schedule an appointment. Um, that line will only be open during that time. Um, so if people call and it's not a time that we're scheduling appointments or it's not a time when we have any appointments available based on dose allocation, um, they'll receive a message indicating that we currently don't have any appointments available. Um, if they're calling during a time when that appointment line is open on Friday afternoons, um, despite the fact that we're staffing it with numerous people, um, you know, there are thousands of people trying to call to get a vaccine. So we experience a very, very high call volume. Um, so there is a good chance that somebody may call and experience a busy signal. Um, if that's the case, we really encourage people to hang up and try, try again. Um, and, and hopefully during that time frame, they can get through to schedule an appointment. 
If unfortunately they're unable to, they know the next week on Friday between 1 and 5 o'clock to call again because that's when our lines will be open to accept appointments for the following week. Great. Thanks. Now, I know um, back in the early stages of the pandemic, we had some significant worries here about hospital capacity. Um, how are we holding up in terms of beds, ventilators, and all, and all the necessities of dealing with a crisis like this? Uh, that's a question that the hospital could probably speak to a little bit better than we can, but we do have, you know, very constant communication with the hospital, the very close partner of ours. And uh, while we have seen certainly hospitalizations increase and are experiencing far more hospitalizations now than we were um, in the very beginning of the pandemic, um, I, I think that our hospitals have done pretty well. Um, I know they've experienced some times when there have been you know, fairly substantial wait times to be admitted, um, but I know currently they are not um, diverting individuals to other hospitals. Dr. Waters, you lead a very strong set of programs here in the College of Health Sciences at Gardner-Webb. How has the pandemic changed the way in which we prepare and educate healthcare workers for the future? Telehealth is the word. Uh, telehealth is something that before in the curriculum for the health sciences is something that you, you talked about a little bit and then maybe you gained experience in a clinical setting or in a practicum setting and that was only if that office or the hospital setting used telehealth at that moment. Now, since COVID has occurred, telehealth is used everywhere and that's something that for C will continue to use because whenever you think about it, in the years that I, I, I worked as a triage nurse and on the phone, you try to talk to a patient and say, explain to me what your wound looks like, what's the colors and all of that. Well, now you actually have a monitor that you can see this on. So that that's, it increases the ability to assess the patient. So that's something that we have really had to work with in 2020 is how do we incorporate this into a telehealth simulation into our programs. Not only talk about it and say, have you seen it? Do you know what it is? But to actually practice and use it. And what telehealth simulation is, is just where you practice, someone is being a patient on the other side of the monitor, and the health students, they are actually uh, practicing to be the nurse practitioner, the physician assistant, or the nurse, and assessing you in that capacity. Something that um, I have experienced in utilizing telehealth is that it's very difficult to show uh, caring and compassion and the things that you can do at the bedside. And I think that's something that we have really, uh, we, we need to talk more about. How can we still show that in a telehealth, virtual healthcare delivery world? The other thing is, is um, interprofessional education. We always talk about you need to to talk to everyone in the healthcare setting, make sure you know what the medical doctor wants to do, the nurse practitioner, the radiology tech, various things. But with COVID and the, the limited ability to be face-to-face -face with individuals, I think that that has brought more light into the, being added more to the curriculum. We're very fortunate that we actually were able to purchase two telehealth units for the College of Health Sciences in the fall. So that's something that we'll be able to add to that simulation. And then we did apply for a foundation grant in the fall that we received for additional funding to purchase more equipment to help add that to our curriculum. Is it too early for you to be able to tell if this pandemic is drawing more people, for example, to the nursing field? Uh, are people rallying uh, to, to the healthcare professions or are they a little bit uh, timid and spooked by the prospect of becoming a I nurse? Think, I think that's gonna be, um, of, I'd like to say that they're being rallied and that they want to be part of. That was the answer I was hoping for. Yeah, I, I, that's what I want. I want everybody to be so excited about nursing or, or things that I am. But at the same time, I know that I, I have a lot of colleagues that are, are, are burnt out at the moment. But we, we all have to be there for them. Um, but it, it's just, it's remarkable work that they're doing. So I hope that they are being drawn toward health sciences. So you're all health professionals. I'm a political scientist. I'm gonna to try to ask a question that connects the two. Um, to what extent 
do you believe that the pandemic has been politicized? And to what extent, if so, does this hinder our ability to, to combat the spread of COVID? And, and, and I think about you know, things like mask wearing, physical distancing, lockdowns. These, I think, have become um, political footballs a little bit, especially last year during an election year. What's, what's your assessment of the, the politics of all this? I can speak from, from kind of our perspective or my perspective on that. And I do think that some of the precautions that we have really put into place to help us combat COVID-19 have become very politicized. And it has created uh, a really tense place for public health as we continue to try and educate and bring awareness to the community. Uh, for us, it's not political. It really is just about trying to protect the whole community and make them aware that these are avenues that they can pursue and these are why we want them to wear them. And so um, for us, it has really created a lot of challenges as we continue to fight COVID-19. Anybody else? I mean, I would really just echo what Tiffany said. And, um, you know, I I've really just been trying to encourage individuals that, you know, think of mask wearing or other things perhaps being as a signal of your political party or whatever may have you to really just, um, you know, wear a mask, social distance, do those things, not because it's in an executive order or not because somebody tells you that you should um, or that you have to, but really just think about, you know, why it's important to do those things and encourage people to do it for the right reason. You know, if not to protect yourself, but to protect other individuals that are around you. Um, you know, especially those vulnerable populations, if you have parents or grandparents or loved ones that, you know, maybe are over the age of 65 or have underlying health conditions to, to not, you know, operate from the mindset that, you know, we shouldn't have to do this or why do we have to do this or why can they tell us that we have to do this, but just think about it more so of, you know, why it's being asked of you and do it for selfless reasons and to help protect other individuals. Now, Dr. Waters, you, you mentioned burnout. Um, to what extent do you folks believe that there's such a thing as pandemic fatigue, that, that people on the front lines are just worn down? Um, and, and if so, how are we prioritizing mental health um, and resilience of, of everybody? I mean, frontline workers, students, general community. It's, it's wearing on people. I mean, I very much think that there is a truly pandemic fatigue. Uh, sometimes in the public health field, uh, we, we've kind of coined the term quarantine fatigue. Um, you know, people are very much over the pandemic. Um, they're ready for things to go back to normal. Uh, we absolutely understand that and recognize that. Um, you know, as, as much as I think the general population is um, you know, ready for the pandemic to be over. So are we as public health professionals and everybody else. I think it's impacted absolutely everybody um, in likely a negative way in some shape, form, or fashion, but just in very, very different ways, depending on who you are and what your situation is. Um, I, I try to remind people that although we are over the virus, the virus is not over. Um, and, and so, you know, if, if, we're, we're all in this together and we all want the same thing. We all want to come out on the other side, but I think the really, really important thing to, to remember is if, if that is what we want, then it really takes all of us working together to accomplish that. Um, the more we, we act as though things are normal, the more it actually drives us in the opposite direction. Um, it's working against what we're, what we're hoping to accomplish. So, you know, by really just cracking down and continuing to do those simple things and simple behaviors that, you know, you, you hear us harp about all the time, um, you know, such as waiting six feet apart and wearing your mask and washing your hands, um, you know, if we continue to do those things, we'll, we'll get what we want much, much sooner. Um, but if we continue to go in the opposite direction because that's what we want, it's really just pushing us further and further from our goal, unfortunately. And I'd like to add, I think as we close on starting to close on year one, just to say year one, that causes fatigue in its own. Um, so anytime that you are exposed to something new, something stressful to this level for a longer period of time, 
then fatigue is going to set in. This may be an odd question, um, but do you think that there have been any net benefits that emerge out of this catastrophic situation? I do. Duchesne, actually, we were just talking about this earlier. One of the things, and Dr. Waters mentioned it as well with the telehealth and, and utilizing that, is this focus now on virtual platforms and really giving us this innovative way to connect with one another, not only in social ways, but through businesses, through schools, through healthcare. It's really pushed us to be more innovative and to find those unique ways. So although COVID has touched us in many negative ways, I do feel like it has pushed us to be extremely innovative in how we do business and how we function as a society. I would add to that too, one thing that I think about when I think about just the benefits for you know, public health specifically and the community likely as a whole is the way that it's brought, although we want people to stay apart, it has brought people together in many, many ways. Um, you know, I think about community partnerships um, you know, I, we likely would not be sitting here working so closely with Gardner-Webb if it wasn't for coronavirus. Um, you know, I, I participate in, in weekly um, meetings with Gardner-Webb staff to, to talk through, um, you know, mitigation policies and procedures and response and quarantine and all of that stuff. But, um, you know, throughout this entire experience, um, I've seen the community really, really come together um, and rally and support each other, um, not just through community partners, but um, just you know, community residents as a whole, churches and other people coming together to you know, support individuals who, because they're in quarantine, they don't have the ability to go out and get groceries, um, or individuals that you know, don't have transportation. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes in the hardest times, it, it can bring out ugly in people, but I think it also sometimes can bring out the very best in people, and I really have seen a lot of that throughout this. So with 2020, I think a lot of people had time to reflect, refocus, and maybe even repurpose what, what they're doing in their life. But the other thing from just to add to theirs is, um, especially in rural areas, you know, the addition for rural health to focus more on that, but also the internet infrastructure for the people living in those areas to have access to their um, internet for educational purposes and, and telehealth. So I have seen that as a positive um, as well for 2020. So I'm gonna try to sneak in one more question here before we open it up to our students. Um, so as a college president, one of the things back in the old days, the pre-COVID days that we wouldn't think twice about, shaking hands with every student that crosses the stage at graduation. And I guess the, the question is, do you think once this is all past us, that the new normal is gonna look like the old normal or that there'll be some things that we just never do anymore? I can start with that one. Um, I thought about this. I've thought about this many times and the best that I think that I can um, illustrate is if, and, and I know some of you won't understand this, but 9-11 whenever that happened, that changed our world and how we travel, security, and various things. Um, so I, I think that this event here is like that. It, it has changed things moving forward, um, both positive and negative. But uh, I hope we'll be able to go back to shaking hands and uh, hugs and various things. I think there'll be people that'll be very hesitant or a little resistant or grab their hand sanitizer, you know, immediately, immediately after. But I, I do think that we do have things set in that will be changed forever. I agree. And in fact, I think it would almost be a missed opportunity if we didn't continue, you know, some of the things that we've begun um, as a result of COVID-19, um, you know, such as some of those things that we've already talked about with utilization of new technologies and ideas and strategies. Um, but then I think, you know, other things will, you know, very much return to normal. So I think it's, I think it'll be a, a balance between the two. I'm excited to see what graduations are going to look like um, this year. I, as I mentioned before, I really have um, a grown appreciation for the innovation that not only education has faced, but many of our other sectors. And I feel like that's one of the unique facets that have really come to light with this is how we do those really traditional ceremonies. So as both of them have mentioned, I imagine that there will be some things that, that stick and there will be some things that fall to the wayside. 
be interesting to see how it all plays out. All right, so we've got some high ability handpicked students here in our audience and I'm gonna ask them to come to the microphone and introduce themselves and ask a question if they've got a pressing one. And I know they do. Hi, my name is Casey Allman and my question is for Dr. Waters. How do you think a limited uh, hands-on clinical experience could affect our future healthcare workers and what are your advice for people entering the medical field this year? Well, I'll ask you to repeat that just a little bit louder for right. me. Um, how do you think a limited clinical hands-on experience could be affecting our future healthcare workers and what is your advice to people entering the medical field this year in the pandemic? All right, so whenever... Um, Whenever we first went into, we moved everything into online, the online learning, for our clinical perspectives, for all of our programs, of course, that went into a, a makeup clinical virtual simulation modalities. That is a struggle because we want to do that face to face. I think that in partnering with the hospitals and local health organizations, they will know that whenever students graduate. I'm very glad to say that since the fall, we have started back clinicals and, and full-time clinicals, but it's gonna take everybody to understand that these students did not have a, a full clinical learning capacity as they would have. The advice that I would give to a student that's graduating and going into healthcare is that you, you have that orientation period. And uh, so in that orientation period, and unfortunately it's a long period of time, just soak up everything that you can, ask questions, raise your hand, be the first one to volunteer, and, and just get in there and, and do what you have been prepared at the novice level. So just get in there and, re and really at that point, it, it's time to, to learn at the next level. But just to ask the questions and to start doing. Does that answer? Good evening, my name is Blake Elizalde, I'm a sophomore here. Um, I just wanna thank the panel and Dr. Downs for moderating, moderating this, the discussion. Um, my question is kind of open panel. Um, when do you think my college peers and myself will be able to get the vaccine? And when do you see, I guess, mask wearing and social distancing kind of disappearing? So I can take the first stab at that. Um, currently, according to North Carolina DHHS uh, vaccine prioritization framework, college students likely fall into group five, which is our um, last group, unless, of course, they have some other um, high risk condition that may allow them to fall into group four, which are those that are at risk for most severe illness. So it could be a little while um, if, re if the production lines for both of our vaccines continue to increase, as the federal government has indicated should happen. Um, hopefully we'll get to those sooner than later. As far as mask wearing and some of the precautions that are in place, the recommendation is still, regardless of vaccination, to continue those practices until we, we reach about 70% herd immunity. Um, currently, I know Deshay's got this number more specifically, but I think we're around 15% um, in the county, so we still have a little ways to go. Um, so likely the masks um, are gonna stick around for a little while and the hand washing and the social distancing, but um, I think there is hope and as vaccine production continues to increase, we could see um, that sooner than later. Hi, I'm Jillian Sword. Um, my question's open to any of the panelists. I'm just piggybacking off of what Blake kind of said. Um, once it does get to group five or group four, if you are in that position, um, do you think it's gonna be something that you have to have as the vaccine to come back to school or be present in class? Um, or is it just like, any other vaccine that if you kind of have it, if you don't have it, it doesn't really matter, or is that gonna have to be on your like immunization records to go back to school? I have not seen any specific guidance, at least initially, that it would be a requirement that any particular sector or group have the vaccine to participate in certain activities. Um, I, I think it could, there, there's possibility that over time it could potentially transition to that. Um, but I don't expect at least initially once it opens up to, you know, group four and moving forward um, that it would be a requirement that you have that. 
Hi, my name is Tim Bennett. Um, I'm actually part of the College of Health Sciences and I'm a member of our swim team here at Gardner-Webb. And growing up, uh, organized sports was a really just important part of my life and I recognize how important it is to young children in their development as well as college students in the time that they spend. And I would just love to hear from uh, anyone kind of what the directive is as far as for just the, the students, the young students and the college students of this county and what that looks like for organized sports and what the county is looking to do with that. I think that organized sports are a very important part of you know many young people's life. I grew up playing sports my whole life. I actually played volleyball here at Gardner Webb for four years. Um, so I, I certainly recognize the the importance of that and the positive role that it can play for young people and development and teamwork and many many other things. Um, you know, and, and many organized sports have actually begun back with certain. Um, you know, protocols and procedures in place to help sure, ensure that they are done in the, the safest way possible. And, you know, I think that's really the key, whether we're talking about sports or we're talking about, you know, other community activities, uh, if we're talking about, you know, the reopening of, of businesses and other things, um, you know, I think it's, it's about striking a balance between how do we offer these things that, that people need that are important, that they need access to, that have many, many benefits, but how do we do them in the most safe way possible? Um, I, I think you can do both in, in many, many situations. It's possible to have both. Um, so, you know, with, with sports, you know, continuing at least at this point to do those while wearing masks, uh, to maintain social distancing to the extent possible, um, to make sure that we're, you know, properly sanitizing equipment and not sharing equipment and, you know, just having those processes in place to help ensure that when we are doing them, we're just doing them in the safest way that we can. Hey, my name is uh, Thomas Manning. Um, so I have a question concerning like the long-term impact of living through a pandemic on the mental and emotional health of like young people in particular, like if you could, what do you see evolving with young people and their mental and emotional health over the next few years as they grow up through this? I can start. Um, really, I, we know across um, research over the last 10 months that um, especially adolescent mental health has definitely been impacted. And I think mental health across every age category really has. Um, I know there was a research article conducted out of South Carolina that said about 25% of all emergency room visits for adolescents um, were connected back to some uh, mental health condition that they were seeing over the last 10 months. And so I do think that over the next few years, we will see an even more dramatic shift in our focus on mental health and really pushing resources in those directions to support not only our students, but our adults also that are combating uh, many mental health conditions that previously maybe did not receive the attention or the resources that they have in the past. Any other questions from our students? Tim Bennett, back for another. Hi, Tim Bennett again. Um, I just want to ask about as far as um, with all the sanitation that's been going on, is there any kind of fear of a developing of the COVID vaccine, of, of COVID itself becoming and developing a resistance to different types of uh, killer, all these different cleaners that we're using? Or is there any kind of fear of just other, um, like the flu or different kinds of bacteria becoming resistant to all the different things we're using because we're using so much all the place everywhere? Is that a fear and uh, is that something that's kind of being talked about or what's going on there? That's a good question. So um, I think that's something that would have to be explored more. And I think that's something that we'll have a fuller understanding later. I think at the moment we're focused so much on the now, the issue that we have in front of us and how we combat what we have in front of us at the moment, since it does cause a severe reactions in, in, in certain populations. So that is an area that would be a, a long-term research down the road. It, it's not an area that I have a fear in or have really heard other individuals express concerns in. But again, I think it's just because we're in the now. I hope that helps some. I'm gonna piggyback off that because Tim raised the word fear. For the three of you, 
What's your biggest fear as we head deeper into 2021? I think for me, as far as kind of public health and our team, back to that pandemic fatigue notion is our team works uh, really day in and day out to do case investigations, contact tracing, education, and now vaccination. And so if we continue, right now we're on a really good downward trajectory as far as cases in the county, but if for some reason we were to see a significant spike, um, that further just puts limitations on our resources as public health. And so. Uh, for 2021, that would be a concern of mine as we continue to move forward in the pandemic is really just taxing our resources um, even more. Deshae, any fears? I would say probably one of my biggest fears is just with, with having the vaccine available and seeing some of the decreases that we're currently experiencing, that it would send this notion that we no longer need to do all these things that are important to continue to prevent the, the virus from spreading. Um, people may be getting a little bit too comfortable. Hope is great, right? We, we wanna have hope. I'm very hopeful. Um, I'm confident that between the vaccine and our continued practices that we will beat COVID. Um, my fear is that it will be extended longer than necessary because people get a little bit too comfortable and too relaxed and let their guards down. Um, you know, we saw huge increases in our cases after Thanksgiving. Um, we started to recover from that a little bit. And then here comes uh, Christmas and New Year's. Saw another very, very steep increase in our cases. Uh, we're beginning to recover from that as well. Our cases are beginning to come back down. Um, and then comes something like spring break. And everybody, you know, goes out and lets their guard down and uh, then we experience another sharp increase that then overburdens our, our resources, our um, public health response, our hospitals. Um, so while, you know, I certainly want to spread hope and, you know, a very positive message and, and do believe that we will come out on the other side of this and, and much stronger than we were when we went in, um, really just encourage people to not let your guard down just yet. So you may be pleased to know that at Gardner Webb we will be teaching through spring break. So we, we well, will not be contributing you just to the spike. My fears. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Waters, any significant uh, fear as we get deeper into 21? This one's going to be my favorite question, I do believe, for tonight. Um, I have been gifted with an unshakable faith. So I, I really don't, I try not to live in the world of fear because I know who is in control. And I know that, that God already knows the, the other side of this. But the things that I do struggle with, not a fear, but struggle is what do students do whenever they can't be in a clinical setting or what happens whenever we do send them home. I do struggle with that because we want them to have as much learning uh, experiential as they can. I struggle with that I have former students that are working on COVID units. They are uh, working the, the long hours, the long shifts, and, and they're doing the, the battle of this. And I, I struggle with the uh, uh, main struggle that I have. I have a huge passion for medical missions. And that's something that I've not been able to co-lead a group of students since 2019 on a trip. And so it, it, those are the things that I struggle with. But again, I know who is in control and I know who has the, this at the end of it. Very good. Well said. So um, we're in the midst of a moment right now. We're struggling. We're fighting our way through this pandemic. But human history teaches us that civilization's been dealing with this forever, right? If it's not the bubonic plague, it's the Spanish flu of 1919. I mean, we, th this is part of human history. Do you think we're, we're going to be better prepared for the next one that rolls out and smacks us in the head? From a public health perspective, I think absolutely. Uh, similar to what Dr. Waters mentioned after 9-11. So after 9-11 actually sparked continuing kind of pandemic planning from the public health perspective. And so we have uh, pandemic flu plans and these uh, points of dispensing plans in place because of that. And so um, from our lens, really, I think we're only gonna get stronger from here. We're gonna continue to plan across all sectors now. And I think it's gonna increase our awareness really around that planning and how to prepare effectively as we move forward. 
to show you think we're smarter? Absolutely. I think that we've, we've learned a lot and we will continue to learn. And Tiffany and I were actually talking about just that before we came uh, over here tonight. And, you know, she mentioned planning and, you know, uh, having a plan is great. And, and in public health, we do a lot of planning through our preparedness efforts and other efforts. You know, she mentioned the, the pan flu. Uh, you know, we have plans for H1N1, uh, but a plan is only as good as it is able to be operationalized and implemented. And so I think, you know, one of the lessons learned, I guess you could say, and one thing that I think what we'll do better moving forward is, you know, we, we've had these plans, we have had to operationalize them more than we ever thought we would, but, you know, making sure that when we have these plans, they're not just something that, that sits on a shelf. They're something that are uh, constantly revised and updated and practiced and tested. And I think if, you know, we continue to do that in the future, we'll be more prepared than ever. Dr. Waters, Gardner-Webb going to be ready next time? Yes, I'm confident we are smarter. And I think that you're always going to have a blind side. Something's going to come from somewhere that you didn't know. But I think we have been so flexible, adaptable, and learned to pivot very quickly that that will help us in the future. Last question um, for our two friends from the county. How can Gardner-Webb University be a better partner in helping you mitigate COVID-19? I think doing things like this is very helpful, just getting education out to as many people in our community as we can and really helping answer questions that they have um, helps us. If, if people are more informed and better to make um, you know, equitable decisions for themselves, it really does help us in public health. And so hosting things like this, educating your students, educating everyone who's connected with Gardner-Webb and in, an, in as many ways as you can is very, very helpful from our perspective. I could not agree more. That's exactly what I was going to say. I think that, you, you know, you have a lot of reach, um, not only on the campus, but within the community, especially, you know, across Bowling Springs and elsewhere. And so, you know, helping to be our messengers. I know that there's a lot of misinformation and inaccurate information and just a lot of, you know, questions and things that people don't understand. Uh, you know, we've really been trying to work hard to empower others to kind of be our champions. Um, whether that's through, um, you know, Gardner-Webb or local churches or whatever the case may be. I think, um, you know, from a, the public health perspective, if, if we can, you know, empower you all to then go out into the community, your reach is much, much uh, greater and, you know, expands further than ours does as a single agency. Um, so I think anything that you all can do to, to help be our messengers and spread accurate information um, is very, very helpful. So around here, we like to say that we're a, a private university with a very public mission. And so we, we, we take that responsibility very seriously. So we look for ways to help. Um, listen, uh, we are so thankful to the three of you, Tiffany Hansen, Deshay Oliver, Dr. Nicole Waters. Thank you for your time and your expertise and all the work that you're doing to help Cleveland County get through this protracted pandemic. And thank you to our students, and thank you to everyone who has watched at home um, via a, a virtual format. So this concludes uh, our first web connections. Thank you so much. Thank you all.